National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homedy, thanks so much for your time with us today. Thank you for having me. Now you have been very outspoken about rail safety concerns and a lack of rail safety regulation. And we know that derailments are less common nowadays than they used to be, but we're also seeing longer, heavier trains with more hazardous materials. So that being said, do you think that the damage from today's derailments are much greater than in years past? I think it's difficult to compare uh, because every, every incident is different. Uh, with respect to rail safety generally, uh, it's extremely safe uh, versus if you put that traffic on our nation's roads. With that said, the NTSB has issued many recommendations to improve rail safety prevent, to prevent uh, this type of tragedy that occurred in East Palestine from uh, occurring in the first place. Mm -hmm. If only our recommendations were implemented. Now, you mentioned that the the accident in East Palestine was preventable. Are you still confident that this disaster was preventable? And what are your what are the specific recommendations that you want to see done first? 100% preventable. This was a preventable tragedy. In this situation, we are at the stage where we are pulling together our final report, which will include a lot of factual information and analysis. And as part of that, we will issue safety recommendations maybe to the Federal Railroad Administration, which is responsible for rail safety, possibly to the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration that's responsible for the safe transportation of hazmat on all modes, possibly to railroads. We also may issue some recommendations to state and local entities and possibly even the unions regarding worker safety. Our recommendations are quite broad uh, and go, can go to any entity. But what I will say is we don't have to wait to take action. The NTSB has issued a lot of information regarding this particular accident. And we have 190 rail safety recommendations on the books today that no one has taken action on. We have 380 others that were closed because people took unacceptable action. Those over 500 recommendations, we don't need to wait. We shouldn't wait for the next tragedy. We should take action now. Yeah, and you mentioned almost the 200 recommendations that you've already made, but no progress has been made on those recommendations. Is that frustrating to you? Yes, it's frustrating. It, it's not just frustrating to me. It's frustrating to the investigators on the ground because when we show up on scene after a tragedy, they know this was preventable and that we've issued a recommendation previously that would have prevented that. When there's a loss of life, that's terrible. That's absolutely terrible and inexcusable that action wasn't taken. What would have stopped this derailment from happening and other derailments that happen across the country? Well, again, that'll be part of our final investigative report. But what we did provide very early on was the immediate cause, which was this was an overheated rail bearing. So we may look at everything from the temperature thresholds that the railroads used to set out that car. Uh, they are all different on the railroads. How they uh, monitor the temperatures of the bearings? Do they do trend analysis over time to tell them when to replace them, when they are failing? We don't, running these things to failure is not okay for railroad operations. So there is a lot there that we will issue in our final investigative report, but these are all issues we've talked about already. And do you think that that needs to be mandated using updated hot box detectors and, and adjusting the temperature threshold to make it more uniform rather than letting the companies decide on whatever they think is best? Do you think Congress needs to mandate that? I think if the operators don't take action, I think there, and if the regulator doesn't take action, it's up to Congress to mandate action. 
What that action is is something I leave up to them. They have to be very careful in how they craft it to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences. For example, a great example is inspection of rail cars. If we set a minimum threshold in law, does that drive all the operators to just do the minimum? So we have to be very careful in what are the requirements, but also there's no reason for to, to get to the point where Congress has to act when action can be taken now. If the rail companies aren't mandated to do these things, it leaves the safety standards up to them to implement. implement. So do you think that a mandate is the only way to make sure that safety changes are made? I don't think it's the only way. I think when you go to Congress, I think you shouldn't have to go to Congress for a mandate. Uh, I, I've seen lots of safety change occur through all of our accident investigations and all modes of transportation where we're working with operators to make change immediately. But in situations where they refuse to take action, yes, that's where the federal regulator and Congress come in to ensure public safety. Mm -hmm. And going off of that, we know the Railway Safety Act of 2023, that has been introduced by um, Ohio U.S. Senators. It's stuck in committee, and it does leave most of the regulation up to the Transportation Secretary to draft, but that is a political appointee and subject to change if and when there's a new administration and there's also uh, they're also susceptible to industry pressure so you've said it's not enough to pass a bill and move on do you think that bill is too weak no I think that uh, the bill that they have before them is addressing the issues that they see so far in the investigation from the information we've provided from the two day of two days to ten hours a day hearing uh, where we provided a lot of factual information and over 5,000 pages in our public docket of evidence. So they're using that to help craft their legislation. They're also using our previous recommendations, for example, providing notification and information to first responders. That's part of that bipartisan legislation. Those are things that can be acted on immediately, uh, but that's up to Congress to do that. I know there has been some concern that the bill may lack specifics. It leaves a lot of the regulation up to the Secretary of Transportation to draft at a later date. So with that being said, is there concern that industry lobbyists could continue to fight to water down this bill? Because there's been a lot of resistance from the rail industry in the past when there's an effort to introduce new safety laws. Well, uh, you know, I worked for Congress for 14 years. And I've seen uh, afterwards when you pass laws, there are differences in regulations. That has to play out in the regulatory process. Uh, in this case, the Federal Railroad Administration would take comments from the public, from all entities. And they would evaluate that in their final regulations and hopefully it would come out in a way that would ensure public safety but there are changes throughout the process of any sort of rulemaking. Do you think lobbying plays any kind of role in a lack of rail regulation? You know, I think uh, when it comes to regulations, regardless of what mode of transportation you talk about, there's a lot of focus on the cost over the benefits. The NTSB's job, which I love, is to tell you the truth. This is what would prevent you from, re from prevent this from reoccurring. It's not what's fiscally available and digestible. It's not what might get you there. It's always will get you uh, to the end result of preventing tragedy. Uh, but a lot of times in rulemaking, cost becomes part of the factor, and that's something that the Federal Railroad Administration needs to grapple with. And we know these are billion dollar companies. Do you think that things like technology, because you mentioned that um, people point out the cost and they could be expensive to invest and implement new technology, but do you think that there are simple changes like that that these companies could afford that aren't being done? And why is that? 
Well, again, that, uh, we will look at technologies and trend analysis uh, and decision making on thresholds and uh, how you monitor the health of wheel bearings throughout in our investigation. But in general, there are a lot of safety technologies out there that, it, a lot of technology that can improve safety. I like to remind folks that technology is there to supplement humans, supplement the workforce. It's not there to supplant the workforce. Uh, key is technology that works in tandem with the workforce to, pr to protect safety. So what regulations do you believe Congress, if it was up to you right now after seeing what happened in East Palestine and all of the, the realms that you've investigated, what regulations do you believe Congress should specifically pass that would make an immediate impact? Two things that we have already recommended. First, making sure that local communities throughout the United States have the information they need on what's on a train coming through their community. Why that's important is because the first responders that are first, that are there when it happens, who are there to protect life and property, have the information they need, the gear they need, the tools they need, so that they are able to respond and protect the public, also themselves. A second uh, in recommendation that we have issued is eliminating tank cars that are not as robust and protective as the, the most recent uh, uh, construction of tank cars. We have long recommended that D DOT 111 tank cars be removed from high hazard service, including flammable gases. That has not been done. It's phased over time only for flammable liquids. Another one that could be done is changing the definition of what is a high hazard flammable train coming through your community. We have long been on record that that is a, it's a ridiculous standard of you have to have 20 cars that are solely dedicated to one particular hazmat or 35 throughout uh, the train. One car is thousands of gallons of hazardous materials and can do serious damage to a local community. Yet some of the standards only apply when you have 20 or 35. That makes no sense. And do you think where they place the hazardous cars would make a huge difference too? Because wouldn't you assume that the impact of the derailment in East Palestine, because they were close together, more than half of the 20 hazardous cars, doesn't that make the impact of the derailment worse as well? Train, train makeup is part of this. It's where you put your uh, most dangerous chemicals and what you're putting them next to. Uh, especially if you're putting them next to the locomotive, where we have also issued recommendations to separate hazardous material by at least several tank cars, empty tank cars, to protect the crew. Now you're talking about a local community. You have to keep that in mind as you're making up these trains. So clearly when that train was loaded in East Palestine and those 11 cars were next to each other, that could have been done differently and minimized the impact? Yeah, again, we'll look at what impact that had in this particular case, but in any, in any situation, train makeup is something that must be carefully considered. And why would they not address that? Is it because there may be priority of getting certain train cars to certain places quicker? Is that why they might place them together in one area? Uh, it's a question for the railroads, not one I can answer. So now that we are one year, one year later since the February East Palestine train derailment, are we any safer today than we were last February? Depends on your definition of safer. First, I will say, when it comes to train, uh, transportation by passenger rail or freight rail, it's much safer going on our rail network than on our highways. What I don't want to see is hazmat 
coming off our railroads and going onto our roads. That is a much more dangerous situation for everybody, the entire public. 43,000 people are dying on our nation's roads annually. Millions more are injured. With that said, there's a lot we can improve uh, on our rail network when it comes to safety, and we should take immediate action. Uh, so there are measures that we could take today to improve safety a lot more than it has been done so far. And many may say, you know, one year later, how can communities be safer if there is no new regulation or no new mandates put into place when nearly half of the U.S. population lives within two miles of a major rail line? Yeah, I, I think that is a really important point. I think communities deserve to see action. Uh, at the same time, I do know the railroads have looked at spacing between wayside detectors, hot bearing detectors. They've uh, taken some action to look at phasing out certain tank cars in a much quicker way. Uh, and there has been some uh, guidance from the Federal Railroad Administration on changing the definition of high hazard flammable trains, but it's not enough. What I will say is there's a lot we've already put out there that can be acted on. There are some things that remain for our final investigative report that we hope that I will push for action to be taken on immediately. And one last thing I want to ask you about the hotbox detector, as you mentioned, there's been some push uh, over the distance and adding more hotbox detectors. We've also seen rail companies cut a portion of the rail workers who inspect the hotbox detectors in recent years. So is that enough then, if they're cutting the workers who inspect those? So what you can't have is a situation where your workforce is doing more with less. And I do believe there's an impact, an incredible impact on safety when you are cutting your workforce uh, to such, uh, such levels as has been done the past several years, which is exactly the reason why during the two-day hearing, I showed the reductions in the workforce since the start of precision scheduled railroading. A cut in workforce directly impacts safety. And do you think precision scheduled railroading where it's more longer trains, uh, heavier, longer trains, but less of them is my understanding. Do you think that that is a contribution to what led to the kind of derailments like we saw in East Palestine? Is that really a concern of yours? Well, my, uh, I do have a concern generally uh, just on um, the rail safety issues that again uh, have not been addressed so far. In this particular event, this was a 149 car train with a distributed power unit and two locomotives. It wasn't a particularly long train. However, there are communities across the United States that are facing blocked crossings. Ambulances can't get across. That's a separate issue. We, we don't have recommendations on it, but it's certainly a safety impact. I think that's everything I can think of, Robert. Do you have anything else? No, that was good. Is there any, well, is there anything else, Chairwoman, that you can think of that I didn't ask you about? Well, I did, really quick, just for our knowledge, yes. I wanted to ask about when, I know the, um, the train derailment investigations take like a year or so, but do you have any hints as to when it's going to be finished and anything else you can tell us about what you're looking at specifically? Yeah, I mean, I, I can, a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, looking at our two-day hearing, is a helpful hint on where we're going. First of all, we're going to want to look at what did the emergency responders, what information did that community have? And was it provided in a timely manner? Did everyone have the information they needed in incident command to make the right decision? 13 minutes to make a decision on whether to vent and burn. 13 minutes is not enough time. And what information did they have? What information didn't they have? Uh, that is key. We're going to look at uh, trending, uh, what the railroads do to monitor trends uh, in overheated rail, uh, roller bearings, uh, wheel bearings. Uh, do they, how do they monitor their fleet? 
How do they take action proactively to ensure they're not running them to failure? Uh, one issue that has not gotten a lot of um, discussion is the issue of the uh, inward facing camera in the locomotive. We have long recommended 12 continuous hours of footage so we can see what preceded that. It's not to somehow monitor the train crew. First of all, we've seen in other locomotives and other events where it's clear in the video that crew wasn't properly trained. So then we go look at something. It, we can analyze. We can also take audio, if it has audio, and, and, and really uh, reduce the noise around it to listen to also what other noises could lead us uh, down a particular path in an investigation. In this case, uh, Congress mandated that commuter and inner city passenger railroads implement inward facing cameras for 12 continuous hours. The freight railroads are not part of that mandate, so there's no mandate to have that camera in the first place, much less 12 hours. And they excluded audio. So, do you think it's odd that some of that video got erased? I, I understand it. There was only like 20 minutes of video that was turned in, and then it was overwritten when it switched to another locomotive. Is that correct? Is that a strange situation, or is that normal for that to happen? It can happen. It happens in all the events. I, I don't think there was any sort of malfeasance there at all. Uh, it's un just unfortunate because that's evidence that's lost. Has there been anything interesting that is maybe shocking to you or unique that you've seen in this investigation? You know, uh, two things that I, I think um, are key. Number one, we and I showed some of the footage at the two-day hearing. We have footage of first responders who are knee-deep in whatever chemical and water they're using, uh, not knowing what they're fighting. And I think about the responders who are out there risking their lives in a situation where they have no idea what they're dealing with. They were literally fighting this massive fire blind. So I think about what are the effects to them short term and long term. And then I, I think about the local community. In this situation, I feel like the local community rightfully needed answers right away on what was going on, and, which is why we held this hearing there. I was not leaving the day before that hearing until I answered all their questions. And we're going to go back to East Palestine for the final investigative board meeting. I think we as a federal agency need to go to local communities, answer their questions as best as we can, and give them the information in real time so it can help inform what they're, what they're seeing. Do you feel there was a lack of transparency after the train disaster in East Palestine? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the public, uh, the, com the surrounding communities in Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, they were really at a loss. Uh, they needed information. They needed health information, environmental information, which is different than what we provide, but they also needed information about then what, what we were finding. Mm -hmm. And throughout this investigation, I, I felt it was so important that we get as much information out there as we can, which is why we have 5,000 pages in our docket right now, why we did the hearing. They deserve that, and they need it. Uh, the, you know, the other, other thing I'll mention is we're about to release another group of information between January 25th and January 29th. So really, the end of this week, uh, the uh, end of this week, uh, yeah, end of this week into next week, we're going to do another insert into the docket of public information. The great part about this is you're going to get all our factual reports. 
So when the NTSB does an investigation, we have experts, those are in, our investigators in a particular field, where they will look at just part of that investigation. So emergency response, tank cars, mm -hmm. wheel bearings, uh, inspections of rail cars. Th those are different teams. They all produce a factual report of everything they've gathered and found in this investigation. No analysis yet, that's to come, but all of that will be in the docket in the next insert within the next couple of days. So uh, event and burn is always considered as part of the, the decision making in this sort of scenario. There are many choices. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration has issued guidance on vent and burn procedures. So we're going to first and foremost look at what happened during that 13 minutes, what information was pro provided, did incident command and the incident command sy system have all the information they needed for the decision, uh, and was the guidance used and uh, whether the guidance was appropriate. Does the guidance need to change? Uh, and then what was occurring after the decision was made in the hours or days after that decision? We'll look at that as well. Okay. And back to Are We Safer Today, when we take a look at the changes that have been made in the past year, you mentioned that it's a start, but that more could be done. That being said, do you think that based on what we've seen, the same derailment could still happen in another community under the current standards? Absolutely. It can happen today. It can happen an hour from now. Our experience at the NTSB tells us that these events could happen again, will happen again. What we need to ensure is that safety measures are taken to prevent that from occurring, but in the worst case situation where it does occur again, we're gonna be there and we're gonna remind everyone of what we've said for decades and what needs to be implemented.